welcome to Long Shorts from the Long U.S. China Institute at UC Irvine. I'm Emily Baum, and today I'm here with Arnab Ghosh, an associate professor at Harvard University and author of the book, Making It Count, Statistics and Statecraft in the Early People's Republic of China. Arnab, thanks so much for talking with me all the way from India. Oh, thank you, Emily. Thank you so much for having me. So the subtitle of your book is Statistics and Statecraft, and maybe we can just start off by talking about the relationship between the two. Why, for the Chinese Communist Party, was statistical knowledge seen as so essential for the creation of a new socialist China in the 1950s? So, so this is a great question. I think in, in some ways the most immediate answer for this is that um, as a party that then came to power and wanted to uh, sort of implement uh, an entire mode of governance that was based on socialist planning, on Marxism and Leninism, um, the, the idea that things had to be planned was central to the way in which they thought about governance. And in some ways, planning is only possible when you have information that allows you to think about what needs to be done. Uh, and if you're thinking about governance, then the most basic kind of information is statistical information, quantitative information about the state of the country, you know, from the number of people, which is the most basic thing one can think of, uh, to how much uh, the industry is producing, how much agriculture is producing, and so on. So in some ways, it presumes you can only plan if you have data. So planning presumes data. So in some ways, that's sort of the most intricate, almost fundamental connection that you can see between the two. So we tend to think about statistics as reflecting a sort of objective truth, that the numbers don't lie. But one of the themes in your book is that actually the collection and the interpretation of statistics can occur in a variety of ways. So what was the Chinese Communist Party's approach to statistical knowledge, and how did this approach differ from that of, say, the United States? So I think what's interesting about this particular moment, not just in Chinese history, but in global history, more broadly speaking, uh, is an intense, it's not the only moment I think that you, you can locate other instances like this, but it's, it's a moment of intense confidence in using numbers to plan, to decide on policy, to understand problems and so on. Uh, so in some ways, I think this is a, a moment where it's, whether, whether it's Chinese statisticians, whether it's people in the US, whether it's people in the USSR, they're all thinking in very, very sort of, you might even think of, call this as positivist ways, that, that if we have the numbers, the numbers will be allow us to arrive at this sort of pure, untainted truth, and then that will allow us to address whatever problems, whatever policies we want to enact. Uh, what's, what's interesting, of course, though, is that uh, even if there is this particular understanding, it gets refracted through uh, different, a, a lens that is ideological, the Cold War by itself, uh, which then imposes certain kinds of restrictions on what this means for um, the, the methods that one might deploy. So to, to put it even more simply, uh, you, uh, you see in China a rejection of what was at that point in time a fairly global understanding of what statistics ought to be, which is statistics is a universal science applicable across pretty much any domain of knowledge, whether you're looking at the natural world, the social world, the interstellar world, uh, it's just a common set of tools. Uh, and this was uh, an understanding that had evolved over the past couple of centuries and important to this understanding was what a lot of uh, historians of science of primarily Europe and the US have, have termed as the probabilistic revolution. Sort of human beings becoming comfortable with the idea that probability and chance are a naturally occurring feature of the world uh, and we can still count, we can still get at a, a reasonable, ac reasonably accurate sense of the world uh, by using these kinds of probabilistic means. So it's not something that we need to be afraid of, it's something that we can actually control uh, and use productively. What the Chinese do, deeply inspired by the Soviets in the 1950s, is to say, no, that's entirely incorrect. Statistics is not a universal science. Statistics is a social science. It is only applicable to the social world. Uh, if you want to look at the natural world, if you want to look at uh, the interstellar world, yes, you can apply certain mathematical methods, but you can't call it statistics. They said the social world has no place for uncertainty, no place for probability. And this they arrived at from a, a fairly reductive reading of Marxist theological progression. Uh, to, to boil it down in very simple terms, they said, well, um, we actually know how human history unfolds, right? We've read, we've read Marx and we know we're all going to end up in socialism and then eventually in communism. There's nothing uncertain about this. So what we need to figure out is where we are in that stage, perhaps devise policies that will accelerate our progress towards communism, but there is nothing uncertain per se about this. So once you make that distinction, once you make that sort of, and within itself, it's, it's internally consistent, it's rigorous. 
uh, you end up rejecting all kinds of all probabilistic methods in thinking about statistical work. Uh, so uh, even though the the impulse in the in the fifties was actually quite common, which is to to use data to try and understand the world, the way it manifested itself in China vis-a-vis -vis, say the U.S. or India was actually quite quite different, and that's partly what I try and explore in the book and then look at the the implications uh, uh, to all kinds of statistical work. So you mentioned that there was this worldwide confidence in big data. Where did this confidence come from and why do you think it reached a peak during the Cold War? Yeah, so, so, so it's, I think it emerges, so in, in the way I sort of think about it, the, this is, it's, a, it's not a one-off, it's a recurring, I think, uh, human impulse that we can trace at different times. And it's in some ways intricately linked to uh, the capabilities we have to process data. So in some ways it's a function of the capabilities that exist at that particular point in time. And the reason why I think the 50s saw this tremendous uh, uh, sort of enthusiasm for quantitative analysis is because of the kinds of capabilities that have been developed in the immediate preceding, say, two decades. And the, the Second World War actually plays a huge, huge role in this because a lot of the techniques that were developed at that time, uh, whether it is, you know, to how do you maximize the, the efficiency of bombing rates, uh, which is so this sort of macabre <laughs> sort of backstory to this in some way, right? Because it's how do you, how do you win war? How do you effic efficiently use data to prosecute war uh, in the most effective way? Uh, a lot of these technologies emerge through uh, these kinds of considerations. And when you enter the 50s, it then combines with this decolonizing, deliberalizing moment where you have the emergence of several new nation states, you have an attempt to bring about development, how do we think about a better future, and then the fact that they have all these tools, and then this confidence in numbers, I think becomes uh, a, a potent sort of locus for this kind of attention. But as, as I said, this is not the only instance, I think you can find at least another instance of similar quantitative enthusiasm in the late 19th century. I think the 1950s represents a second such moment. And in some ways, I think we're experiencing a, a third moment like that with uh, with the massive sort of computational leaps that have been made in the past 10 years both in terms of storage capacity and in terms of actual computation uh, so i think we go through different moments where we we see this impulse re-emerging uh, but the 50s i think as i described is, is one of those moments of conjuncture where uh, where it becomes almost universal where regardless of ideology the faith is quite universal now today there's a lot of skepticism about the numbers that come out of China and I think coronavirus is probably a good example of that. Um, but how does your book give us new insight into China's approach to data collection? But I think one of the insights that emerges from looking at the 1950s, I think, is to try and disentangle the ways in which numbers might get be biased. So I think there's a broad understanding that all numbers have certain biases. There's no, uh, you know, this goes back to one of the earlier questions you asked, there is no sort of untainted, pure numerical truth. It's always dependent on certain assumptions we make, on um, certain kinds of results at times that we want to see perhaps, that then inform the numbers that are actually produced. And what's interesting in the case of the 1950s is that uh, it helps us look at the different ways in which these biases might be generated. And what I, in, in the book, I, I make this distinction between what I call uh, post hoc manipulation, uh, which is, you know, the kinds of things that we often blame the Chinese government for today, which is, well, is the GDP data from China really reliable because they may have created it or, or they may have produced it and then they, have reali they may have realized, well, it's not high enough for whatever political uh, sort of purpose we have in mind, so we'll massage the data. In the 1950s, I think what, what we find is, and what I describe as, as, as sort of biases that emerge out of first principles, so it's certain kinds of assumptions that go into the very, in this case, the very definition of what statistics is. It's the social science. If it's a social science, it means there's no place for probability and probabilistic methods in statistical research. So this is not a question of willfully trying to manipulate the data after it's been produced to arrive at certain kinds of, you know, again, politically uh, uh, sort of uh, desirable outcomes, but it's much more about certain assumptions that then get coded into the way in which we actually do statistical research. So that, that distinction, I think, is important to also keep in mind today because there might be, in several instances, data that's produced that doesn't always have this kind of post hoc Machiavellian attempt to manipulate. It might be a feature of certain founding assumptions, first principle assumptions. And this is actually true in, I think, most contexts, not just in the Chinese case. Uh, and with COVID data around the world today, this is something that we need to be particularly attentive to uh, because the numbers are uh, 
they're all over the place. And the more we learn, the more we realize that there are all kinds of problems with them. Well, Arnab, thank you again for talking with me. And as someone who generally tends to shy away from numbers, I have to say that your book was very readable and very approachable. Well, thank you so much. It's very kind of you to say so.